According to one source, tourism generates $3 billion annually in Southeast Asia, and sex of one, is one of its most valuable subsectors, employing anywhere from 800,000 to 2 million people. Um, the Burmese trafficking and health researcher uh, Hin Hin Pin notes that in 1989, tourism, which had been an increasingly profitable industry, exploded, becoming the country's major source of foreign exchange, surpassing even exports such as rice and textiles. Um, Thailand's image as a sexual paradise um, pay, played a significant role in the Burmese explosion as well. So sex tourism in Southeast Asia, this is a very typical thing that you will see anywhere in Bangkok. And they have helpful instructions for clients. So welcome to Baby Gogo. -Go. If you like to take a lovely companion with you, choose the number you like so the women are actually numbered. You don't even have to know their name, you just say, oh, I like to look at number 51, I'll take her. Tell the manager or the mamasan, pay the bar fine, so you have to give the bar some money so that you take the girl. Have a happy time and then welcome back. So it's like a merry-go-round. You can go again if you want to. But these kind I mean, it's nice they have instructions. This is I, I only I think I've only seen in Cambodia two bars with instructions on what to do. People seem to know otherwise what to do. Um, but the reason sex tourism, particularly in Bangkok and Manila, started in the first place is because of the Vietnam War. And um, soldiers on R&R &R for a week would go to Manila or Bangkok, because there were the, um, the, the air bases in both of these countries, in the Philippines and Thailand. Um, and so an industry sprung up of hotels that catered to American tastes, of bars, of music, of fashion, like American fashions as opposed to traditional Thai fashions, um, beer, Western food. So in these places, in, Viet in um, Manila and in Bangkok, a huge industry grew up just because of the Vietnam War. It declined a little bit in the um, late 70s and early 80s, but by the mid 80s, both places had taken advantage of the fact that, for that veterans of the Vietnam War were now coming back to visit these same places. And they were opening bars, and they were marrying local women. And tourism really grew in these places. <coughs> It soon um, expanded as more as air travel became cheaper for people in Australia and in Europe. People began traveling to Southeast Asia more and more. Um, and one of the ways travel to Southeast Asia was sold was very much as a place where anything goes. You're not constrained by the normal social limitations of your own country. Which is why I am constantly incensed every time I go back to Phnom Penh at seeing these huge Germans with beer, with beer bellies in tank tops and short shorts, Birkenstocks and long socks, strolling along the road with not one but sometimes two young Khmer girls or Vietnamese girls who look to be about 12. They're not, but you know, it, yeah, I get very, I get very enervated about this. So, but they wouldn't, this, this hairy guy would not dream of going to a bar in his home country in Frankfurt and picking up an 18 year old, that he wouldn't have a chance of it. But they can get away with it there because people are poor and they need money. And often for women, there is no other way for them to, to fulfill their dharma as good daughters. They have to support the family economically. The country has no system of social welfare in place. What are they going to do? There's, there are consumers wanting to buy them. Um, Rapid growth of the most of the rural population in many countries has resulted in worsening living conditions a lot of the time, especially when people are forced off their land and they now have no way of even making a subsistence living. Um, an increase in family size means that less land will be available for cultivation for each member of the family, even if they manage to retain it. Okay. Um, HIV AIDS is also a really a big problem in Southeast Asia. Tradition, again tradition, prevents sex education happening um, at schools and at home. People often have no idea what's going on. With the increase in access to the internet, this has changed, but I know I wouldn't want my son learning sex education from what he might see on the internet. Um, but this is often how people learn about it at all, so they develop very strange ideas. Um, and tradition, for a number of reasons, encourages the perpetuation of prostitution and the exploitation of children, for reasons which I'll talk about in a moment. And then we have the third category of gender. There are more, but I'll stick to mainland in Southeast Asia. So there, are, there is a very long history of, of what we call trans people in the West. 
in um, Southeast Asia. So in Thailand, you have the Kapoi. Um, in Burma, you have the Akhult. In Indonesia, you have the Varia and the Bisu. And in Phil the Philippines, you have the Bakla, um, who are often ignored by governments and by NGO agencies. They're often ostracized by their families. And so no one is really looking out for them, even though historically, um, transgendered people have been very important parts of their communities. For example, this is um, a Kathoi at the court of Rama I, who was a court official, a male to female transgendered court official. No one thought it was particularly odd or weird, it was just in there. In different parts of, um, in different parts of maritime Southeast Asia, uh, if, uh, if a family is famous for being um, a particular kind of shaman, and if the, if the shaman is usually male, but the shaman dies and he only has a daughter, that daughter has to then live as a male for the rest of her life to be able to carry out the ceremonies appropriately, and vice versa in other parts of um, different islands in Indonesia. And no one thinks this is strange or weird, it's just something that happens. This is, you know, well, sorry, we need a male from the family to do this, so, or we need a female from the family to do it, so you've got to. Okay, all right. So they live their lives as the other gender. Katoya are particularly um, well known, I think, for for the reason for sex tourism reasons. Because when foreigners began going to uh, Thailand in the 80s and 90s um, for you know their sexual paradise, they encountered Katoi, a lot of Katoi. So and then it became a kind of fetishized thing. Apparently, the best um, breast implant surgeries in the world are done in Thailand. And the reason is because so many Thai Katoi are now availing themselves of the technology and so transitioning that way. Okay, but this is a really big problem because you know, Western attitudes, again, set places like the World Bank who are giving money to countries in order to improve access to health care, reproductive rights, HIV, AIDS. They, well, okay, so we'll have a, a women's program here and we'll have an OBGYN clinic here. The donors are also not thinking that there is a third gender, so no one's really looking out for them. And governments, in order to be modern, mimic the way that Western <coughs> governments do things, health ministries, etc. So it, it's a bit of a problem. Okay, so going back to what I said about tradition, when women attempt to challenge what is the accepted division of labor or step outside traditional female gender roles by taking on male characteristics, they are often um, they are challenged, often through ridicules, ridicule. So this is a reprint of a book that was published in Cambodia in the 19, 1967. And uh, basically it's about, the whole book is about you should not let your wife get too big. So there's this, in Cambodia there's a saying that you, the wife should never be bigger than the husband. Um, and this means physically, but it also means she should not have more money than him. She should not be, uh, she should not have a better job than him. And she should also never rebuke him. So she, this woman in this picture is doing all kinds of things wrong, right? She's yelling at him. She's blaming him for breaking the vase. Um, she's pointing at him, which is very rude, um, etc. And he's just, we might think in the West that he's sitting there cowed and, and not, you know, just taking it and being submissive. Actually, in Cambodia, the most powerful person in the room, the person with the most omniate, is the person who says nothing. Just, you know, he doesn't need to speak. And when he does speak, he's very authoritative. I've seen this time and time again. So he's actually the one with the power. She's being hysterical and um, being bigger than her husband, which is not permitted. OK. Um, skip over that a little bit. So let's talk about masculinity for a minute. So in the West, we might think guys, well, not since hipsters, but guys who wear skinny jeans, and who are very well groomed and wearing sort of very potent aftershave and things like that aren't particularly masculine, not manly men. Whereas in Southeast Asia, being well groomed and wearing the latest fashion is considered to be incredibly macho, right? So this is um, a billboard, a, an anti-trafficking billboard actually by a, a group in Burma. So as you can see, everyone's looking very hip and very modern here, but we, we wouldn't really consider these guys to be that masculine or macho in the West. Okay, um, I want to say something else about sex sector employees. So it's not just sex workers themselves who are involved, but there are people like dancers. So and often in, you know, part, in part of sex tourism, there will be girls on a stage dancing to entice people, but they will not actually ever be for sale. There are performers of different kinds. 
There are pimps, there are security personnel, there are madams, there are the bar staff who bring the drinks, there are hotel staff, you know, who change the sheets, there are medical attendants a lot of the time if a customer gets out of hand and beats a girl up or something else happens. There are medical attendants who have to be paid not to report it to the police. There are drug connections to keep the girls subdued and sometimes for customers who want to heighten the experience. And the police. I cannot overemphasize how in Southeast Asia, sex sector, the sex sector could not continue without the complicity <laughs> of the police. And this manifests in everything from in a country where prostitution isn't legal, the police taking a bribe to look the other way, to the police in Myanmar who are, who are part of anti-trafficking units actually owning brothels that the girls end up getting tra trafficked to. Okay? Okay. Oh, um, so I've got a couple of little clips here that I wanted to show you briefly. ຄົນຄົນບາງຄົນທີ່ເຮົາແບບລອຍເກມັນລຸກກໍໃສ່ຕົກເກໄວ້ລອຍຈຸດຕະເນີຫາຕິດຍາແນວ <coughs> 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 ແລະກ້ອນສະຫຼັ່ງລອກໃນເວເຊມີ <coughs> 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 